All right, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us for the fourth in our dialogue series, Connecting Generations. Today's session is talking about the correlations between environmental collaboration and conflict resolution and overall health and well being of Native communities. We're joined with a couple of wonderful speakers today. Um, as a reminder, this session is being recorded and the video will be available for viewing afterwards. If at any time you'd like us to pause the recording, um, you don't want any comments or stories shared on the recording, please let us know and we can do that. And uh, with that, um, the other reminder is you can raise your hand if you have questions. Um, please uh, wait until called on before opening up the mic. And then if you have any questions or comments, you can also put those in the chat box and our team, myself, Ben and Lauren Cordova, who will be facilitating today, can um, get to those questions in the chat box. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague uh, who actually is was the impetus for today's session. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Lauren Cordova. Lauren, go ahead. Thanks, Stephanie. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lauren Cordova. I'm Taos Pueblo. I'm actually at Taos Pueblo right now, um, joining you from a rainy, uh, rainy, wet Taos Pueblo. And um, so just to share a little bit about today's topic, um, this is the culmination of our four-part webinar series, which was born out of a conversation that I had with one of our um, Native American congressional interns. Um, so a little bit about the work that I do. Uh, I work with Stephanie and Ben on the Native American and Alaska Native Service Area for the National Center at the Udall Foundation, um, working with environmental conflict resolution and collaboration. But then on the other side of the house, I run a Native American congressional internship program in Washington, DC. So mm -hmm. last year we had a um, intern from Zuni Pueblo who was working in our Udall DC office with me. And um, we were trying to develop a webinar series to bring um, more Native practitioners to the community of practice for ECCR. And we were kind of brainstorming, like, what topics can we talk about to get folks fired up about, you know, that field? So one of the most striking conversations that we had um, during, throughout the course of that brainstorm was about our feeling that the direct connections to sacred sites, ceremonial sites, places where we as Native people go to harvest medicines, to find our traditional foods, landscapes, um, all of these things make us who we are and strengthen our overall public health. So how can we uh, utilize ECCR to protect those spaces or to maintain access to those spaces to ensure that generations to come will still benefit from uh, being able to have that way of life that we have uh, been blessed with. So that's a little about where this topic came from. Um, so just to kind of bring it back, the um, topic for today's session will be exploring the connections between overall health of tribal communities and the environmental issues impacting ceremonial grounds and landscapes. Um, so to kind of kick us off, um, I'll just introduce uh, my, my dad, who's actually uh, been gracious enough to join us today. Uh, my dad is Jerry Cordova. He's a longtime um, House Pueblo tribal leader, spiritual leader. Um, he worked in the federal government for over 40 years. Um, I, th I think we sent out his bio and I'll let him share a little bit. And then also um, we're going to have Rainy and Jadi with us today, which is incredible. She's an indigenous peacemaker. Um, she's a public health administrator. She um, has over, I believe, 20 years experience with IHS and just does some amazing work in her in her community and in Indian country overall. So we're really excited to hear from uh, both of them. And uh, I think we're gonna get started here with uh, my dad. Dad, if you wanna just introduce yourself and then if you wanna talk a little bit about, um, you know, these issues that we've kind of shared with the group already. I'd like, I know that we didn't uh, 
discussed this yesterday, but I, as is customary with all our uh, meetings here at Taos Pueblo, I'd like to open this session up with a little prayer. That was just a short prayer acknowledging the spirits who are always with us uh, wherever we go and especially upon our homelands as tribal people throughout the country and indeed throughout the world. Ours is a connection to the land that cannot be severed. Several entities, beginning with the governments of Spain, Mexico, and the United States have tried to separate us from our lands and our beliefs and have not succeeded. The most notable was our fight with the United States government over the return of 48,000 acres of our forest lands, which include our most sacred site, Blue Lake. Our forefathers believed fervently that if we were to be separated from our lands, that would mean the end of our status as tribal practi religious practitioners. Their beliefs were so strong that they instilled within us that feeling that all the teachings relative to religion and tribal culture were ours and ours alone, that we could not share them with the outside world because of the fear that that would hasten the separation of our people from their lands. In that sense, when we were fighting the federal government for return of our lands, there were some serious discussions within the tribal councils and Kiva circles about how much to divulge about our traditional practices. What should we comfortably share with congressional leaders and our legal representatives for disbursement to the public at large. So in that sense, we today feel comfortable with what we are gonna be discussing today. And that in a sense is what we are gonna be talking about through the course of this discussion. Do you want to share a little bit about Blue Lake for those who don't um, have any kind of context for that particular conflict? Blue Lake is a high country lake situated in the country, as you see in Lauren's backdrop. That is our sacred mountain. And northeast of there, in a crater lies Blue Lake. And from there flows the, the creek that flows through the middle of our Pueblo. Every year we go on a pilgrimage to the lake to acknowledge our beginnings and also our, our end because we as Taos Pueblo people believe that when we leave this earth, our souls do not go to heaven or hell. They go to Blue Lake there to uh, enjoy the rest of our of eternity with our relatives who have gone before us. So Blue Lake is the most sacred of our shrines. There are shrines throughout the reservation 
where our people worship, be they uh, the, pop the tribal population at large or members of kivas or clans. We also have shrines for hunting. We have shrines for different deities that we pray to in order for this world to continue. And we pray for the whole world. We pray for everybody out there because we believe that we are a part of a universe that includes people of all races, of all colors, all beliefs, because we all believe that there is one supreme being who created this earth and all beliefs gravitate towards that deity. So when we eat, when we sleep, when we wake up, when we do work out in the, our agricultural lands, when we hunt, we always pray, we always make offerings, but Blue Lake is the culmination of a whole year of religious practice. And it is believed that, well, our, our tribal leaders in the Blue Lake fight said, Blue Lake is our church. We do not worship in a building. All of the outdoors, is our church because it is where the creator created this beautiful land for us to live and enjoy all the fruits of nature. So that in a sense is what our connection is to the land. And this is the same for all tribal people throughout the country. They in their own particular way belief in a similar fashion. We speak in different languages when we pray to our beings and we sing our songs and we have our ceremonies that are peculiar to us, but we acknowledge that our other relatives throughout the country have similar ceremonies. I know um, we kind of discussed this previously, but in your opinion or in like the, in the long term, if there were to be any kind of loss of Blue Lake, like let's say in the Blue Lake fight, we hadn't have won, what would that have looked like for our people? And what could that look like for other uh, tribal communities, the loss of sacred sites or ceremonial access to these places. During the Blue Lake fight, our elders argued through interpreters that if we lost Blue Lake, it would mean the end of a way of life that we might as well just live like the population at large, subscribe to the beliefs of Christian churches or other religions. And that is not something that our, our grandfathers and our grandmothers taught us. So in a sense, it would mean that we would cease to be Indians. There would be no Indian life as we know it today. So it's unimaginable for a Taos Pueblo Indian to exist without our beliefs because they are so ingrained into our life ways. So that is a threat that was reiterated to us by our forefathers. So therefore it is our charge 
to ensure that we as elders pass these teachings on to our, our youth and our children to ensure that the beliefs and life ways of our people continue into infinity. Did you wanna share anything else? I think that we'll do it for now unless any questions arise. I think we're gonna have some questions after Rainey presents, but thanks. All right, and I think we'll just take it over to Rainey now for a short presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, as Lauren introduced me, I'm Rainey and Jody, and I'm a member of the Mescalero Apache tribe, and we're located in southern New Mexico. And um, I was asked to talk about uh, my experience with um, our tribe's fight with um, the state and and um, politicians and county commissioners regarding a place called Otero Mesa. And I'm going to just share a little bit. Okay, it says it's I'm disabled again from sharing, but I just wanted to show you show you all about Otero Mesa and and just. Um, the, the land that was there is, is sacred to, to our people. We, there's evidence of cultural significance, there's petroglyphs, there's wildlife, there's um, native foods uh, that we still use in our ceremonies there that, that grow um, in abundance. And, and it's a land that's um, kind of secluded and, it, and it's, there's not a lot of, um, there's no infrastructure, there's no economic development. It's just land that has been um, not necessarily forgotten, but just kind of hidden, so to speak. And unfortunately, the US Geological Survey completed a, a highly um, uh, quality assessment that indicated there was a, a massive freshwater aquifer beneath Otero Mesa. And so, of course, um, this um, brought in the attention of, of potential uh, oil drillers and, and, you know, this, of course, the prospect of oil and gas drilling um, started happening and, and the interest just grew and, and no, no, um, nobody took any kind of um, prudent course in examining the environmental impacts of drilling and and uh, and so no consideration was given. So because my family and and some of the, the um, tribal members utilized that area to gather our Indian foods, um, we got wind of this. My son actually got wind of it through um, some far local farmers that were there, and they said, you know, there's some permits that are being. Um, applied for to start drilling and testing this land because it's believed because of this aquifer um, that there's usually evidence of oil. And so he was really concerned about um, the land being impacted and and he's um he was he's very traditional. He participates in our ceremonies with the with the our tribe and he kind of felt this this connection and he's just this little boy and um you know, what does he know about the environment? And, and yet he just had this, this desire to save this, this piece of land that we, that's so far away from, from, from where we live. And, and he just wanted to um, get involved. So he's like, mom, you need to get involved. You need to go to, there's a county meeting and there's a county commissioner's meeting and a town hall meeting and, and this, in this nearby town called Alamogordo. And so I was like, I don't know anything about trying to advocate for land and so we go to this meeting and we hear all the ranchers concerns and we hear you know there's some politicians there and, and um so we just start getting involved and we start writing letters and we start um you know I mean, he, he's just so passionate about it and i'm just so i'm just so um amazed that this little boy you know is is trying to save this land and so anyways, I get involved and I start, you know, writing letters and start um, attending these meetings. 
Am I able to share now? I believe so. Okay, let's try it. And um, we get involved and we um, start um, advocating. And so I just wanna show you a little bit about where it's at. Okay. So this is um, New Mexico and Otero Mesa is right on the border of Texas. And it's just this small little Mesa. It's all this is ranch land here. There's not any kind of development. There's just um, um, a lot of um, shrubs and, and it's famous for the bighorn. Um, and there's other birds there that, that reside there. And so it's you know kind of protected by them. And, and this is a picture of Otero Mesa. And, and you, as you can see, it, it, it's very desolate. There's nothing, um, you know, around and um, dirt roads is the only way to get there. Um, and so here's some petroglyphs that, um, that um, so the petroglyphs, um, because when the, when the oil drillers, Waco was, um, about to, to apply for this land to start testing, they said that there was no cultural significance in their report. And so we had to say, hey, wait a minute, our people um, use that for seasonal residents and there is cultural significance. There's, um, there's evidence of petroglyphs, there's evidence of mezcal roast, uh, mezcal pits that we use when we roast mezcal, the mezcal plants. Um, so we had to hire an uh, uh, individual from the state of um, Arizona State University to come in and do an inventory of all of the petroglyphs and have it documented so that, so that could show that, yeah, see, there is cultural significance. We do need to protect this land. This does have um, ties to Mescalero Apache is all the way back to the Mogollon um, civilization back then. And so um, we really had to fight him. Um, stress that that significance because nobody knew nobody was aware and um, as a result then we definitely got attention um, we even went to the schools and we we started sharing this um, information with the students and telling them you know about uh, Terra Mesa and the threat that's going on and so the students came up with an idea that they would write some um, letters to um, President Obama's daughters, Sasha and Malia. So the class got together and they started writing letters to them thinking that we're gonna bypass the adults and we're gonna go straight to the kids who are our age and we're gonna get them to, to understand, you know, the importance of this and about our muscular culture and, and in the hopes that they would become interested and then they would, you know, let the president know that um, we need to save Otero Mesa. And so that was a big project. And then we would have um, uh, field trips and take, take you know, families. And at that time, it was kind of towards spring. And so um, usually people start gathering their Indian foods for the ceremonies that are happening during the summer. So there was harvest time. So we would take students and their families down to Otero Mesa because it's, it's a very far drive. It's like about four hours from from Mescalero, the Mescalero Reservation. And then we would help them gather and harvest, you know, some of the Indian foods that were, yeah, were blooming at that time. So they got to see it, they got to see how beautiful it was and, and they got to um, take part of uh, gathering the food that um, our community does together. And so as a result of all of this, long story short, um, we got BLM to, to award us so this is Otero Mesa, this little area right here. And this is the area that was in threat. This is where one of the largest aquifer um, things were, it's cisterns inside underneath um, was at. And so this area here was the major threat. And this is where, and so then um, we even had a, a ceremony there. We had a two day blessing over this land and just praying that, you know, this is protected and that we leave it as is the way the creator had um, gifted it to us. And so as a result of all of the hard work and, and um, thankful for all of the like New Mexico Wilderness Alliance and BLM and ranchers, just all of the support that helped us, we got not only this Otero Mesa, but we got all this here. 
so um, it's it. This is all considered the mescalero um, tribal. Uh, well, not really tribal, but it's just considered um, a sacred site status. So as you can see, this says the Alamo Mountain Sacred Site and the Mescalero Apache Ancestry Trail Sacred Site. So we got this all protected here. So we, it, <laughs> I feel like this was a, such a, a major accomplishment that not only that we were just fighting for this little part, but we got 550 additional acres to, to um, protect and, and just so grateful that, you know, that that all paid off and that people were, were um, after we educated them about the, the significance to our culture and, and, and how important this land was that we were heard. We were heard and we were awarded um, abundant of, you know, this land to protect. And down here, I don't know if you've anybody you have heard of Waco Tates, Texas, that's down here in, in the Texas, um, state of Texas. And that's all, that's considered a, a national park. So that one's protected as well. But um, yeah, just to, um, you know, share that the land is very sacred, that there are um, a lot of cultural significance that people aren't aware of. And just because Mescalero Reservation isn't near here, it still has strong ties to the culture, to the beliefs. And, and to this day, we still um, go down and utilize, um, you know, the areas where we can harvest our Indian food. And then this is just a letter that the BLM wrote to me, um, just acknowledging that you know they were gonna um, um, give this uh, site to us as a sacred site status. So just a big accomplishment, and um, and just very fortunate to to be on that ride. If it weren't for my son, I would probably need, even know <laughs> how to go about this. But um, I just you know share that with other tribes who who struggle with, you know, getting land back. And I work with a, a organization called Life Comes From It that does philanthropy work. And we work with indigenous communities to get their land back to, um, to kind of help them along their process and fighting for their land and, and um, just educating, you know, about the importance of sacred sites. Thank you. Thanks, Rainy. Um, all right, so now we've got some time for some questions. And I did see that there was a question in the chat. Uh, let me go ahead and pull that up. We got a couple questions from Judy, um, one to Jerry and one to Rainy. All right, so the first question here is, I'm going to ask about the nature of the fight for Blue Lake and the outcomes. Was this a legal filing based on Pueblo rights? Did you want to answer that, Dad? Yes. Okay. Let me get down, get to the uh, origins of the conflict because it goes back to the administration of President Theodore Roosevelt in 1906. At that time, he was so ca caught up in the fervor of uh, uh, preserving public lands because he was out, an outdoor enthusiast. So he came up with the idea of creating a system of national forest. So when it came to the uh, Carson National Forest, which is located in north north central New Mexico. The federal government looked at that whole region, and again, as was uh, thought back when uh, exploration first started in this country, non-Indians looked at this whole expanse of land and said, "There's nothing there. It's unoccupied. Therefore, we're going to incorporate all of these." so-called Indian lands into the national forest system. So thereby the, our tribal lands that we had inhabited and used for hundreds of years were by a stroke of a pen 
taken from us and incorporated into the public land system for this country. So our elders started fighting, again, writing letters, uh, putting bugs in politicians' ears, uh, appealing to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, our uh, so-called guardian, for assistance, all to no avail. So the, the conflict continued right up through the 1950s and 60s when uh, a very powerful politician, the senior senator of New Mexico, Clinton P. Anderson, who had been the Secretary of Agriculture under the uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration, took over the administration of uh, uh, federal lands and uh, the Forest Service was included in the Department of Agriculture. So he was of the mind that uh, timber should be harvested on public lands, regardless of who laid claim to it. So there started that uh, practice of exploiting the, na the natural resources within the, the lands that we called our, our uh, tribal, tribally historic uh, use areas. So our elders appealed to national organizations, including the um, uh, Council of Churches. And then, strangely enough, the town of Taos, which actually lays cla claim to fame for being the, the residence of uh, artists, renowned artists who made their fortunes painting Indians. So uh, fundraising activity started in earnest and uh, the, uh, the politicians got into the act. Senator Anderson also, got revved up and uh, was more, even more determined that, uh, as a matter of fact, he did say the Indians would give this land over my dead body. So uh, the um, several Democrat, Democratic senators who were uh, favorable to Indians took up the cause including uh, Senator Ted Kennedy, uh, Senator from Oklahoma, Fred Harris, and uh, they spearheaded an, er an effort in Washington to drum up support for the Indians' cause. So President Richard Nixon, who was one of the more maligned presidents in our history, was in office at the time. And through a quirk of history, several individuals within his administration put a bug in his ear and advised him that going with supporting the Taos Pueblo Blue Lake claim would put him in great standing with the Indian tribes throughout the country. So lo and behold, uh, in the uh, final fight for, for uh, Blue Lake, which raged through 1968 and 69, the uh, Democrats who had the majority in the Senate and uh, also the House were able to ramrod legislation despite Senator Anderson's opposition. So. In December of 1970, President Nixon signed legislation 
that would return 48,000 acres of prime forest land back to United to the uh, Taos Pueblo people. And the legislation stated that the lands would remain in wilderness status. Therefore, there could be no development on those lands. And that kept the developers at bay. So that ensured that the people would have free use of the lands to, show, to worship as they please with limited harvesting of timber. Of course, we would have uh, hunting and fishing rights and uh, gathering rights of plants and for medicinal purposes and for food. So that added to the land base of our tribe. So that uh, that is one aspect of our hopes for continuation of our way of life because we our land for now is locked up legally and no one can take it away without a big fight and without it cut costing them a lot of money. All right, thank you. I see that um, Eric has has a hand up. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks to our speakers. I, I had two questions, uh, and I'll just share both at the same time. So the first one is for Rainy, and I'm really curious to know uh, what was the impact of the letter from the children to uh, President Obama's children, if, if there's any uh, feedback on that. And then a, a broader question, uh, both to you, Rainey, and to Jerry. I, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about um, offshore wind development recently, and, and I'm thinking about um, on the theme of, of why we're here today, uh, it, I, just to hear your reflections on the, the meaning to have development taking place in the ocean. So it's not the same as land, uh, exactly the same because it's, it's uh, right different as, as the ocean, but but there are uh, sacred sites there and there's uh, a, a sacredness and a spirit to the ocean as well it, from the perspective of tribes. So I'm curious to hear um, in, in terms of uh, right, how, how we would think about this topic in terms of the ocean rather than on land. Well, let me start off uh, I would not purport to be an expert on uh, oceans. Uh, our people do not have ocean uh, property anywhere near us. So whatever water we have is very precious here. So uh, I would defer to any uh, coastal tribes who would have uh, beliefs that are uh, contigu contiguous to ocean lands and shores. Rainy, did you uh, want to take that? So, yeah, so thank you. We did get a, a representative kind of um, from the White House addressing the children and uh, um, the students and in that that their packets were received and they, that there would just be um, later conversation uh, regarding that. But I, uh, to this day, I don't believe that we had actually received uh, response from the daughters. It was just kind of like a uh, a general response from the White House, you know, just letting them know, yeah, this was received. Um, but yeah, but I think just the fact that they got that, they were excited and 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 you know, inspired that they were heard. Yeah, it was a beautiful idea. I, I just loved hearing. That. Just to add my two two bits here. The uh, letter writing from children uh, has a lot of impact on the people of our country. We had at Taos Pueblo a uh, very dedicated teacher who started an art class at the day school here. And it evolved into a project of compiling a book of the children's art and the book went on the market through the efforts of several volunteers and organizations 
the book was printed and put on the market and all the proceeds of the children's efforts went into the Blue Lake Fund. And that had a great impact on the people of New Mexico and it carried over into Washington. Thanks. I wanna get back to um, one question in the chat so we don't skip over it. It was uh, Judy's question to, I believe, Rainey. Did the state of New Mexico make that sacred site designation? Well, the state of New Mexico. Oh, 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 Dad, so sorry, that was for Rainey. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> So BLM in conjunction with BLM, then yes, um, that was that was considered something that um, just because on, on, on their support and on their behalf, and because that land was under their jurisdiction, they had the authority to to make that possible. And Judy, did you have another question? Well, maybe an observation. So hearing from both speakers today, there's a balance to be found in thinking about alliances and coalition building. So where are you getting your advocates from and being careful about what you, what information you share and relate. So you need to share some information in order to build those coalitions and yet that information once it's released becomes public and who knows whose hands are it's going to fall into and cultural sites and the devastation that happens can both of you um, maybe speak a little bit to that when i spoke earlier of our grandfather's efforts to convince people both in the White House uh, and in Congress, and indeed throughout the country about the significance of our uh, sacred lands. They were very careful to admonish uh, the tribal council and Kiva leaders that there were some bits and pieces of our beliefs that could not be divulged to anybody who was not initiated into the clan system here at Taos Pueblo because it harkened back to an earlier time uh, when Spain invaded the Southwest part of the country uh, at the Padres behest the uh, Spanish government was very actively trying to suppress tribal religion. And to that extent, the, uh, the Padres would um, set up a system of informants, people who were sympathetic to, to the, the cause of the, the Spaniards were asked to uh, uh, identify Kiva leaders, religious leaders, who were then uh, arrested, tortured, and um, pretty much uh, put to, to the test of their beliefs. Because if you recall, the Inquisition was going full blast in Spain at this time. So the Spanish government took, took those practices and brought them over here and put them into use at the behest of the Catholic priest and the uh, soldiers. So it was said the religion went underground at that time. And from that time, secrecy was the byword as far as our relations with the non-Indians. And that carries over today. The, uh, the knowledge that I have regarding our religious practices is still only for those individuals who are initiated into the tribal religious uh, clan system 
and not for anybody else's use. We realize that any information that, that may slip out uh, with an ever curious press and other uh, inquisitive types may find its way into the hands of those that do not mean well for us. So that is why we hold on to our beliefs so strongly. Lauren asked me to jump in to give a facilitation break. Um, thank you, Jerry, that was really helpful. Rainey, did you have any thoughts in terms of Judy's question about how to balance what to share and how to share? And did you have any of those discussions with Atero Mesa? Yes, we did. And um, what we could share, we did share, especially with um, having the cultural significance of the petroglyphs and then just the history and then just the food. Um, you know, food sovereignty is a big thing with indigenous communities. And what we did not share was the details of the ceremony that we we're going to have the blessing where we went and we did a two day blessing. And we said that we, we got permission to do that. But that was something that we did on our own and um, without any outside influence, you know, as Jerry had um, mentioned, that was something that that was secluded for our people. And, and we had that respect where we got to do that um for you know just for the prayer and for for the protection of the land so so they were respectful of that blm was respectful of that the ranchers were expect, um, respectful of that so they allowed that to happen um you know as a result of this of us advocating for this land thanks Rainey. and then sarah i just saw your hand go up but we did have two other questions in front of you um but I think they're both National Center staff, so they're going to defer to you. So go ahead, Sarah. Oh, OK. Thanks. Um, and thank you again to the speakers. I really appreciated it. Um, and I'll lower my hand. It took me a long time to figure out how to raise my hand. My apologies. <laughs> um, I wanted to reflect just a little bit based on experience uh, as a tribal attorney working with folks to protect sacred sites in the context of, um, I mean, materially off-reservation development is, is, is a really different animal than on-reservation matters because there's so much more, as the speakers have shared, you have so much more to say when you have trust land or you have on-reservation property. Um, you also, I mean, we're fighting now um, some fights where we have a good foothold, but a lot of there are a lot of growth opportunities for the federal and state agencies involved. Um, in um, off-reservation treaty reserved territories where people really do get some things about hunting, fishing, and gathering rights. There's a whole sector of things they don't get about those rights. And then there's a whole bunch that they don't get about what really counts as a tribal or a traditional cultural property um, for tribal folks in areas. And I'm up here in Minnesota. So, you know, we think a lot about um, well, there's a huge, huge variety of cultural properties, um, including a lot of living, changing landscapes. Um, some of the experiences we've had here um, include getting into the weeds with folks who mean well, but just literally don't know how to do it. Um, and we deal with um, pretty limited federal guidance. Um, folks might be familiar with Bulletin 38 that's been around since the early 90s and is it has to do with evaluating what's just in that setting called traditional cultural properties and it encompasses everything um, not just particular tribal um, historic properties but it needs revision um, we've gone through several rounds of trying to get that revision done um, and haven't seen it come out. There is other guidance too um, through uh, that relates to National Historic Preservation Act processes and some things that are helpful. Um, examples I hear come up are, you know, strategies for state and federal agencies to protect sites without identifying them too clearly. Um, but it even requires a huge amount of trust, I feel. Um, and helping bridge the gap. That's frankly, I think where facilitation and ECCR might be a good use 
or might have a, a home, um, you know, those section 106 consultations we have are one thing, but, you know, people aren't going to talk if they get in that room and don't have trust. Um, they're not even going to say, maybe don't go in that exact area. This area is not quite the same issue. You know, you're not even going to say that, right? Um, you know, the, the tribal folks <laughs> who've been speaking, um, you know, know intimately, like, even the strat the best strategies I feel like we see in the guidance, it it's not good enough oftentimes. So, um, you know, up here, I would say we have slightly better experiences with our SHPO, the State Historic Preservation Office, but it's based on specific relationships and specific people. Um, and it could change with their with them going, you know, they get that they can't even maintain certain things in their database, but it's pretty tricky, you know? Um, so I'm curious, strategy wise, I heard, um, I heard folks talking about, um, you know, some of the ways that you navigated that um, in the Pacific, ugh, particular Tarot uh, Mesa and the Blue Lake example. Um, are there uh, any other like, practical considerations or things that you see as tools or things that would make it better. I mean, you know, relationship building is great. It takes time. Permits take much less time. Those processes, frankly, suck for these kinds of things. Um, you know, there's just not enough time to do things. Um, and I mean, like, and at the same time, the desperate need to protect sites. So I don't know, that's a big question. You've already answered a lot of that, but I'll stop talking. And I'll, I'll, I'll definitely encourage our speakers to jump in, but we do have other folks on the phone that do this. So if anybody else wants to jump in with tools, raise your hand, it, you know, it's part of this is to share. But um, I'll, I'll, Jerry, I don't know if you had any tools that you would suggest either it, in your role as a spiritual leader for Taos or in your 40 years in the federal service. Any thoughts to um, Sarah's question? To begin with, we have enough on our hands just trying to keep intruders off yeah. our reservations and uh, safeguarding the, uh, the sacred sites that we have. I used to work with BLM and I had experience with all the uh, uh, federal and state laws that have to do with protecting cultural properties. And it's virtually impossible task because you're dealing with the public at large that at times has no idea what you're talking about. That if there is a park that's administered by the federal government or states, that it's theirs to wander around, pick up anything, dig wherever they want. So yeah. I, it's frustrating. You just need to appeal to the the, the better angels of uh, the public to have a better appreciation of these lands and the historic nature of these lands. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure but strengthening uh, existing legislation is going to be of any help, as was stated regarding uh, Bulletin 38. Uh, NAGPRA is effective where the feds have control of the uh, sites that uh, are being protected. So uh, I don't have an answer. I uh, I'm just as frustrated as as all land public land managers are about the in, inability of the feds and state government to safeguard these properties uh, when the public is let loose and they have no appreciation for the nature of these sites. Yeah, that's. Well said. I also, I mean, you got to something else, Mr. Cordoba, about um, there's a real, I think I see real gaps from state to state too. I mean, NAGPRA only goes so far. Um, there's some real hard lines on jurisdiction and state by state. I mean, we have a few hooks that you don't even have elsewhere, I think, under state law here. 
but not very many. There's just huge gaps um, in terms of what people can get away with. And that's the, the thing that I see. Again, it's about the better angels in the long run, but it sure helps to have criminal penalties too. <laughs> And I think we had a little bit of a technical issue. Rainy, are you still on? All right, I'll keep an eye on Rainy. Hopefully we can get Rainy back. Yeah, um, I'm here, I'm sorry. Oh, no worries, no worries. I just wanted to check and, you know, particularly given that you're an indigenous peacemaker and, and you do a lot of that work, did you have any additional thoughts for Sarah in terms of tools or any additional thoughts on um, the public? Yeah, so um, like, this, like I said, this was my first time in learning how to do all of this um, for Otero Mesa. It was, um, it was just by chance that I had met the right people, um, established that re relationship with BLM and meeting um, people from the um, New Mexico Wilderness Alliance and just gaining that type of support. But in peacemaking, this is something that we hold highly in our um, community. And, and just um, getting back to our indigenous roots about talking things out and um, going into a peace circle with a BLM manager or with uh, a director from Wilderness Alliance and, and just, okay, this is the focus. Our focus is this land. Let's, let's have everyone have um, set a sacred space and let's give everyone a chance to talk and you know, provide, introduce the talking tool and, and the, and the guidelines for running this circle. And I think that that's something that really helped us um, to just get on the same page and not be at each other's throats and, you know, trying to advocate for, for um, what we think is right. And, and they're doing the same thing. You know, the government workers are doing the same thing. They're, they're, they have a strong stance and, in, in what they believe is right. But just talking it out in, in a peace circle, I think really um, made a big difference. Thank you, Rainey. And thank you, Sarah, for the question. I, I think it, it's a great um, question to help us think through for those of us on the phone that are conflict resolution and facilitators, you know, the role we can play in connecting folks to each other and setting a space and giving, making that space for groups. Um, and thanks, Eric, for, Eric has to say his goodbyes um, at the top of the hour, but thanks for joining us, Eric. Um, I wanted to see if uh, we had a few folks join in, and it's lovely to see some familiar names join in. Um, let's go to the folks in the queue. So, Seth, I think you had a question for our speakers. Sure, lots on my mind from all of this, but is, I just want to defer to anybody else if there's anyone non-center that had a question first. Okay. Um, well, no, I, I really appreciate um, the the open and deep sharing on on both both of these stories of the sacred sites and you know, calling in from uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico right now. So as someone who grew up in this area in northern New Mexico, both both stories definitely um, uh, res hit me, hit home with me, and I've followed them a little bit. Um, and I, I'm, I'm thinking about, I mean, when we talk about tools, I mean, I'm just always curious for those of us who are mediators and facilitators, what else we can do. Obviously, the public is a huge challenge, like uh, Mr. Cordova was saying, but with like state and federal agencies and those kind of people that we work with in, in these environmental collaboration or conflict resolution processes, how, how we can better create space for this sharing to occur, you know, outside of creating more space and introductions or just um, trying to be, you know, play our impartial role as a mediator, um, even though we may have our own internal uh, biases. Um, and and I, I'm not looking for an answer there, but I just think it's something that we can continue to be mindful about how to create that sharing without also going 
um, as as you both said, you can't share too much about those sites. Um, I was in a, I've been in a lot of meetings with the Corps of Engineers and tribes where um, the Corps wanted more specific information to to protect um, sacred landscapes, but the tribes were reluctant to give them for obvious reasons. Um, you know, the, the kind of GIS type of data that they were requesting um, to, to kind of pinpoint locations that would be broader than like a very sp narrow focus that the agency was limited to. Um, so I don't know if you, either of you have any thoughts on that. Um, that would be great. The only other thing I was going to bring up is uh, Mr. Cordova, as, as you were telling your story about Blue Lake, I couldn't help but think about, or I think it was, it was quite maybe 20 years ago. I, I actually I was able I was asked to help facilitate a meeting on the expansion of the Taos Airport, and I remember and I've read about that a bit. I think it's just interesting to hear your thoughts on. A lot of people may not think about just beyond protecting keeping people from off the land. It's actually there's these residual impacts like you know airplanes flying over sacred sites or nearby or how that could create um, additional impacts that that the general public may not think about and so it's much broader than just kind of um, you know keeping people from trespassing on the space it's, it's about the overall impacts including noise and just uh, visual sightings and things like that and I'm sure that's a big problem with drones these days as well but any thoughts on that um, would be appreciated thank you both I think that's a relatively new area that we're getting into, the noise pollution. And here at Taos, we've, we've had an ongoing uh, brouhaha with uh, those that argue for more development in the Taos area and the expansion of the airport. One of the things that we stressed during the Blue Lake fight was a need for privacy while our uh, tribal members were worshiping out in the forest and sacred sites. And it was absolutely necessary that we have quiet because there was at times chanting that was part of the uh, ritual or uh, prayers that were said aloud. So that discussion resurfaced in the context of the expansion of the um, uh, Taos Airport and uh, the tribe again stressed that the areas where the um, the airplanes would be flying over were part of that wilderness area that we had fought so hard to designate. And uh, curiously, um, when I was in Washington, D.C., uh, I had a meeting with the Secretary of the Air Force over uh, proposed expansion of training areas for uh, Cannon Air Force Base. And uh, uh, some of the flights that were um, scheduled out of Kirtland. And these were low level uh, bombing runs, training their pilots to, to uh, fly over mountainous terrain because this was land that was similar to uh, some of the terrain in the Middle East. So uh, the governor of the Pueblo at the time, uh, again, reiterated the, the discussions that the elders had with uh, the White House and different uh, leaders of Congress about the need for preservation of our lands and uh, uh, keeping disturbances to a minimum. And to his credit, the then Secretary of the Air Force uh, rerouted the um, the training runs that were that they were proposing. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, Seth. Um, recently, with the drones, there have been drone sightings on the Pueblo, like when there were uh, ceremonial activities going on. And as a result, the uh, council actually exercised their right to close the Pueblo off. So 
I feel like that's something that is being uh, utilized by a lot of Pueblo villages since the pandemic is actually closing off the borders and not allowing folks to come in. And then uh, in addition to that, we actually attended a um, data sovereignty tribal, actually Pueblo data sovereignty conference back in like 2019, where they talked about having limits uh, as to the height of where drones or um, like small aircraft could fly over and take pictures because it was becoming a problem with some of the Southern Pueblos where they're like, if you look at Google maps, there's actually pictures on there of the locations of Arkivas and other sacred sites within the villages, which is not okay. So um, I think the general consensus at that meeting was that it's something that we as Pueblo people really need to be aware of it's going to be an ongoing issue and it's going to be something that uh, tribal councils really need to craft um, sort of plans to deal with, so. Thanks to both of you. Um, yeah, that seems really unfortunate because then obviously if you're, you know, it, the actions of a few can hurt, can really affect the rest, everybody like if open, open feast days for, or, you know, at Taos, for example, right? I mean, if, if that becomes, I don't know if it, if that's under consideration, like you're saying, but it becomes closed, then, you know, people that have better intentions won't be able to intend, attend, and it just has ram, wider ramifications. So, yeah, thanks. And um, Rainy, I know you're dealing with tech issues. I didn't know if you had anything you wanted to add. I think we've maybe got one more question and then we can probably wrap up, but I wanted to give you a chance, Rainy. No, I think that's a good point though. Um, yeah, now that in, in all of our technology and you know, as it increases that we definitely have to consider, you know, that I didn't even think drones would be an issue. But wow. Um, Dana, I know you had your, your hand up. I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to have questions or thoughts. So go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you to, to both of our speakers for sharing your stories. Um, I was just, it was great to hear kind of some of these examples of, of successful advocacy where you were you know, able to, to reclaim the lands and so on. Um, just so one thing that's occurring occurring to me and maybe you've started to answer it a bit already with the sort of noise um, issues and so on, but I'm wondering what you would each say is kind of the big, you know, biggest or most significant threats to your life ways and community health these days. Um, even after having kind of won those fights, what are, what are those continuing threats or, or issues that are coming up for you? Um, if it's okay, I know, Rainy, you have to jump into a meeting soon, so I'm, I'm going to see if you had some thoughts first, and then we can close out with Mr. Cordova. Rainy? I think just maintaining that education um, piece to, to those who we encounter about the, their culture and, and the sacredness of, um, you know, our ceremonies, and just, just making sure that they understand that and, and, sh and stressing that to those who, who we work for and, I mean, work with and, and want support. Thank you. Jerry, did you have anything to add? Well, I think I would implore those of you that are in advocacy roles to uh, work with us, educate yourself further about the intricacies of uh, tribal culture and uh, help get the word out about the nature of our sacred sites and uh, our other religious practices. Um, one thing we we didn't mention, and this is something that I encountered in my last days at BLM were the, uh, the fervent believers of the use of public lands who think that they can imitate Indians and uh, 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 
go out and have their encampments and, and indeed even go as far as putting on uh, ghost dances. And uh, I guess that's something that rubs us wrong, although we haven't encountered uh, any here in uh, northern New Mexico, with the exception of people that had an encampment over on the uh, other side of our mountains. But uh, I think that as increases, increasing numbers of people get frustrated with city life and they need to get away from it all, we're going to see increasing encroachment of these individuals on public lands and uh, trying to push the feds and the states to limits uh, that the, uh, the government, government agencies can't really uh, uh, handle. So that's something that we need to be uh, thinking about in, uh, as the days go on uh, uh, regarding discussions of public lands and sacred lands. Thank you so much. And Judy, I saw your hand go up. I think you get our, our last question of the day or comment, well, go ahead. Well, might open up a little conversation. It's in, in hearing all of this, and especially this last piece about the encroachment, when somebody was asking about tools, you know, that G to G relationship is really important because the tribal sovereignty you know, should definitely take precedence over public wants and needs. And there's a political framework in which that all gets balanced out. And just the idea of perseverance and understanding the opportunities that are open and what might work in a particular time. So for instance, judicial pursuits, um, take very long time periods and sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. So San Luis Rey just got their tribal water rights perfected, right? After, I, I wanna say 70 years, but maybe it's longer than that. And then also, you know, the flip side of that is Ling versus Northwest Cemetery. And when, because the Forest Service in Northern California didn't grant sacred site status when they were putting in the Gasky Orleans Road. So they filed. And by the time it went to the Supreme Court, which said, yes, tribal sacred sites need to be considered, but they are not the final determining factor. I mean, California Indian Legal Service was devastated because while the delay, uh, during the delay, the timber industry had bottomed out. So the Gasky or Leans Road didn't get built and it was a local win, but they felt that they lost it. The sacred sites argument for all the tribes across the nation. And, and it was devastating. And in the meanwhile, things, you know, so things emerge after that. And are you able to bring together coalitions and introduce legislation and bypass. So not unlike the physical aspects of tribal trust land on, across this country is that the policies are also patchwork, right? Checkerboard. And you have to take the wins where you can, the setbacks, you know, it's another day and maybe another direction, but I'm, I'm delighted to hear about the efforts that took place in Otera Mesa. And as legislation and executive orders continue to evolve, I hope that it further strengthens the hands of tribes. Thanks, Judy. Um, I do wanna give folks um, some thought, we have some folks thanking our, our speakers. Thank you for this amazing and thought provoking webinar. I learned so much. So I wanted to share that online as well. Um, I just want to turn to folks. I, I think I'm going to, um, close out with final words possibly from Jerry. 
Um, I, an interesting observation I wanted to make though is, and, and thank you, Rainey, for bringing it in, is the, the role of youth. You know, our webinars series has been connecting generations. And I'm so grateful for you for helping us even connect the youth in the work that's being done in terms of messaging and the letter writing and uh, looking at tools and opportunities and who needs to be in those circles or at those tables um, in the discussion. So I really appreciate you for bringing that in. I think it's a nice way for us to cap off this series. Um, but I'll turn to you, Rainey, and then I'll leave I'll leave uh, the last words for Jerry. But Rainey, did you have any last comments or thoughts that you wanted to share with the group before we close out today? Yes, just thank you. As I said earlier, thank you so much for this platform. I think it's very important and it's so much needed and, and we need to spread this. So hopefully this will be a ripple effect so that we can continue to educate and um, you know partner with with um, those who, who want to support us. And just thank you so much for um, allowing me to speak. Thank you. And uh, Lauren, I don't know if you wanted to say anything before we turn it to your father to close us out. <laughs> yeah, just, you know, I just wanna thank our speakers and everybody who showed up today. I think that um, it's important to remember that it is our youth and our future generations who are going to benefit from all of the work that has been done in the past and hopefully some of the work that comes out of this webinar series hopefully folks are inspired to help our communities protect these sacred sites and spaces because i think as demonstrated here it is incredibly important for our communities to maintain that spiritual connection to our lands, uh, to our religion and spirituality, to our identity. Like I wouldn't be here today without my spiritual connection to my lands, my homelands at Taos and at uh, Fort Hall. And it's something that I carry with me every day. It's, you know, um, I think that in the in these really hard times that we're facing as native people where there's a lot of substance abuse, you know, suicide, uh mental illness, all of these different issues that we're facing, we really need these spiritual leaders to help us navigate uh through the challenges that we're facing just like our ancestors did. And the only way we can do that is through utilizing our connections to our sacred sites, harvesting our sacred medicines, getting back to as many traditional foods as we can and carrying that knowledge forward to strengthen ourselves. And so that's kind of where I see this go, this all going. So I don't know if, if, uh, if my dad wants to add anything to that. <laughs> I just, I just wanted to tell everyone that uh, this planet is the only homeland we all have. And it's up to each and every one of us to do our part in making it a better place to live. In that sense, we need to educate ourselves about climate change and we need to do our bit to maintain the aesthetic qualities of this land. It's frightening to see the number of wildland fires throughout the country, the, uh, the, the flooding that's caused by forest lands being stripped of forage, the oceans rising, and if we don't do anything to curtail further erosion of our land base uh, through careless use of fire, uh, disposing of trash, and maintaining the quality of our water, then I think the end is in inevitable. And we need to always be aware of that. 
and I appreciate all of your efforts. And I pray for each and every one of you that you may be strengthened by the spirits of Blue Lake in your endeavors. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jerry and Rainey and Lauren. And um, with that, I'm gonna talk, stop the recording and wish you all a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you.